Okay, so do these things come up? I mean, where do they come up in, in real world? They're all over the place, you know, if you think about it. Uh, here's one that's actually used. Uh, there's lots of hackers' tools out there, okay, that people use, you know, to uh, do various things. And one thing you might want to do if you were a hacker, if you got, uh, if you say you got some malware running on someone's system and you got access to their machine, okay, so you could do things with their machine. You could use it for whatever you want to use it for. You might want to make the communications with that machine covert in the sense that nobody would know that you're actually doing these things, all right? Or it would at least be hard to trace back to you if something, somebody did discover something wrong with this machine that's not behaving appropriately. Well, here's, there is such a tool that involves uh, using TCP. Okay, so here's the TCP header. We'll look at uh, networking stuff here in a few minutes uh, in more detail, but you know, here's a header, and there's a bunch of stuff in here, right? Okay, things like source, port, destination port, and so on. Those are important things. We can't really mess around with those. But, you know, there is some stuff here, like uh, this field called reserved, which is used for what? For nothing. Okay, it's not used. So we want a covert channel. What could we do? Hey, there's some bits that nobody's using, nobody's in the right mind is going to even look at. Let's just put our secret information in there. As long as the other guy knows to look there and take the information out, we can communicate. It's not intended as a communication path by whoever designed this, but it's just there free for the taking. Okay, so you know, it's probably not so covert, right? Somebody could, if they were really conscious, they were trying to eliminate covert channels, they might just randomize those bits or they might just zero them out or whatever. So that might not be so, so stealthy might be easy to uh, uh, get around. So uh, these people who designed this tool called Covert TCP, they have a few more clever ways to do this. Uh, and what they do is they, uh, there's a couple ways to do it, but one thing, one of the options is to use the sequence number. Okay, now what's the uh, sequence number used for in TCP? The yeah, it's to order the packets, right? Okay, now, when you start a communication, you have to choose the initial sequence number. How do you choose, how are you supposed to choose that initial sequence number? Random. At random. You're supposed to choose a random number. Hey, you know, a random number could be anything. <laughs> so I can just put my data in the sequence number, right? Whatever information I want to communicate. And I could even encrypt those bits if I wanted. Then it would really look like random bits, right? You have no, you know. We'll look at random as anything. Okay, so you can hide information in that uh, sequence number. And in fact, you can be a little more clever than that. Uh, you can actually play with the acknowledgement numbers as well, but sequence numbers, let's look at that. So here's, here's the tool, covert TCP. So now, again, I've got, you know, I'm the evil guy over here who, who's gotten control of some innocent person's computer over here. I've installed this tool, covert TCP, over there. Okay, now I want to communicate, tell it to do something, you know, whatever. Send spam to, you know, to uh, chairman of the department or something, whatever. So I want to do something, uh, something with it. So I want to communicate, but I don't want to do it directly, you know, because that would give me away, potentially. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this covert TCP. I'm going to create a bogus packet. I'm going to put my information here in the sequence number. Okay, I'm going to say that this came from B. It didn't really come from B, it came from me, I'm A, right? Okay, but I'm going to say it came from B, and I'm going to send it to this, uh, uh, sorry, I'm going to say it came from C. <laughs> okay, over there. Uh, and I'm going to send it to this server here that has nothing to do with covert TCP, doesn't know anything about what's going on. Okay, so what's it going to do? It's going to reply to who it thinks it came from. Okay, it thinks it came from C, so it replies to C, the sequence number goes into the ACK field, okay, when it replies, and this guy over here with the covert TCP knows to look, I mean that tool knows to look, take the information out, and now it knows what to do. And it doesn't even look like it came from me, right? So even if they figure out something's wrong, they have to go back to this server, and you know, are they ever going to be able to trace it back to me? You know, pretty unlikely. Okay. So real world covert channels are not at all difficult to come up with, okay? Lots of things like this out there. Okay, so any questions, covert channels? 
Uh, okay, another kind of odd little topic here at the end, uh, inference control. Um, and just let's start with an example. Okay, suppose there's a database out there somewhere. Uh, and you want, you're able to query this database. But the information in the database is supposed to be, you know, it's supposed to protect people's privacy. It's just supposed to give you access to sort of general facts and general information, okay, that's gathered from these various people. So you pose a question. You say, what's the average salary of female CS professors at DeskJSU? And it tells you some number. And then you ask the question, how many female CS professors are there at DeskJSU? And it tells you one. <laughs> and you go in, well, maybe there's two or three, but I suppose it tells you one. You go and you look up and you say, you, know, you go to the website, you immediately know that person's salary. Okay, and that's supposed to be personal information. Except not in California because that's actually public information. But <laughs> anyway. So the point here is if you ask the right questions, you can get specific information from you know, general questions. All right? You're not supposed to be able to do that. Well, it, you know, a more realistic example would be uh, medical records. Okay, medical records are actually a gold mine, you know, for research. You can look for correlations for diseases and things like that, but, you know, people want their privacy protected. So how do you make the information in the records public without revealing information that's personal uh, is really the question. Okay. So what are we going to do? <coughs> What's the first thing we have to do? Remove the names. Remove the names, okay. And probably social security numbers <laughs> and address, okay. So remove sort of all the obvious identifying information. Is that enough? No, I mean, just like the previous example, that's not going to be enough. If you ask the right questions, you can zero in on, you know, sort of like the game 20 questions, right? You ask the right <laughs> questions, you zero in on that specific information that you're looking for. Okay, so what else can we do? If there's very few yes answers to a question. Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay, so if the number of responses is too small or if the percentage of the information comes from too small of a number of, re of people, you could just refuse to give that information. Anything else? Well, you could add some noise, right? You could just throw some random stuff in there, make it a little bit noisy, and it's, and it's much harder to get that information that you desire. But on the other hand, if you add some noise, what's that going to do to your medical research study here? Might be bad if it's a very rare disease that you're looking at, and all your correlation comes from some noise. Okay, so yeah, there's various things you can do. Um, so removing the names and so on, yeah, you certainly have to do that, but that's not enough. Okay, so what? What more can you do? Uh, okay, so this is just what was mentioned. Uh, they call it query set size control. Okay, if the answer, uh, the number of you know, uh, people that the response comes from is too small, you know, say one, two, whatever, depending on the question, I suppose, don't, don't return. Okay, this is kind of a refined, more refined form of that. It's just uh, uh, end respondent K percent dominance. So it says don't release this statistic if K percent or more comes from N or fewer respondents. Okay, so it's just a more refined form of this. This is actually used in U.S. Census data. So if you want to query the census data, they do this, and this would be kind of non-trivial, right? You'd have to think about, you know, depends on what the question is, you know, for you know financial data, it's going to be different than for demographic data, you know, so how do you set those parameters uh, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and here's an example, you know, suppose you queried the census data for the average net worth of everyone in Bill Gates' neighborhood. You know, well, you know, 99% you know, of it came from one person, right, so. He doesn't have his own neighborhood, just one person? Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe, maybe so his neighborhood is just one person, so that would be easy. <laughs> Uh, you could think about using some form of randomization, adding a small amount of noise and so on, but you know, potential problems there depending on how sensitive the results uh, need to be. And there are lots of others. You can uh, look this stuff up and there's lots of techniques people use. Uh, uh, but none are really satisfactory. That's kind of the bottom line. Okay, so in a sense, it's sort of like the uh, covert channels, right? You can do something to reduce the capacity to make the attacker's life more difficult more challenging, but you can't prevent the problem. Okay, it's just 
just an inherent problem. If they work hard enough and uh, are dedicated enough, they'll probably get the answer. Okay. Uh, okay, so let's suppose a robust inference control, really strong inference control is impossible. Okay. So the question is, is it worth it? Should we do something that's weak or should we just do nothing at all? Should we just give up, and, you know, just let anybody access anything? In other words, is it better to do something or to do nothing? Of course it's better to do something, right? I mean, really, what have you lost, right? You've just made the attacker's job more difficult. It's not that much harder to build in some protections like this, so of course it's better to do something. Well, how about covert channels? So covert channel protection, you know, it's, uh, it, we can't make it perfect. There's always going to be a covert channel, okay? But is it worth it to do something to make the covert channels harder to exploit, you know, lower the capacity and so on? Or should we just do nothing? Yes, of course you got to do something, right? Okay, yeah, of course. Well, how about this then? Uh, how about weak cryptography? Suppose we have a crypto system, but um, it's not very good. And that's the only system we have available. And we know there's attacks on it and such, but you know, it's going to take some work to break and all that sort of stuff. So is it better to do nothing and just send your unencrypted data that anybody can read, or should we encrypt it and protect it at least a little bit? Zimmerman Telegraph. What's it? Is that the Zimmerman Telegraph? Okay. <laughs> okay, this is kind of different. Okay, why is this different? Because then you trust the uh, system to, uh, to give you sensitive information into it, which you might trust that it's not, uh, it is protected, but Oh, okay, so you could say it sort of gives you a false sense of security. Okay, so that's true, but okay, that's that's good. But from a practical point of view, what's what's maybe the problem here? You're marking the data with, I'm trying to hide this. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so think about this. Suppose you send your emails, right? Most email on the internet is not encrypted. There's a huge volume of email out there. Anybody who's looking, you know, for some particular, you know, information or some important information, you know, is going to be hard pressed to find it if you just send your email. It just blends in with the crowd. It's a, it's the herd, you know. You're out there somewhere. How do they pick yours out from this big mass of data? On the other hand, if you encrypt it with a weak cipher, what does that say? It's like a big red flag saying, "Hey, this is important data. Take a look at me." Right? Okay, so someone could filter out that data and say, hey, this, is, this may be important. And then, because it's weak, they would be able to break it and uh, read it. Okay, so this is actually a different uh, issue. Probably, in most cases, it's better to do nothing than to use a weak cipher. Okay, because again, you're, th I mean, think about it from, say, I don't know, uh, say the FBI. So they're out there looking for uh, people, you know, for terrorists. So terrorists sends information saying, hey, I'm going to blow up this building, okay? Now, if it's not encrypted, there's probably a lot of nutty people sending stuff, you know. <laughs> even if they're filtering for, you know, for keywords and such, it's going to be hard to filter out, you know. And if they're careful, it's going to be really hard to filter that out. On the other hand, if it's encrypted, it's going to stand out, okay? So you're standing out from the, from the crowd. So that's probably not a good idea. But you terrorists, go ahead and encrypt you know, your email with weak sectors. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so it's really the filtering problem. You kind of solve this hard filtering problem for somebody.